Tennessee State University alums to the Board of Trustees. Uh, we discussed that yesterday uh, and even uh, laid out exactly who all of those members are. Here they are again. Now, uh, the folks at Tennessee Holler, uh, they, of course, uh, are a nemesis of the Republicans there in the legislature. Uh, they actually um, shot this video here where the Speaker of the House uh, said, oh, there were some Democrats who were very much uh, supportive of this effort. Listen to this. What did you think about the TSU bill in there? Did you feel like the optics are as bad as some of those Democrats no, because, were saying? No, no because you have the Democrat caucus that we worked with and that some were supporting it. They Who was supporting it? They didn't seem to be supportive of that. You need to go talk to them. There were no Dems that voted for that. Behind the scenes they were. Oh, behind the scenes. Oh, you're trying to start stuff, huh? Which ones? Of course, now attention has to turn to what is next to have conversations with the governor and the administration about board members, the composition of those members. Yeah, we just heard from um, Speaker, and they said that you guys, some Democrat lawmakers, were aware that they were going to bring this amendment forward and were on board. Is that true? We had an amendment in government operations that vacated three board members. That was the amendment we thought was going to be on the bill. Now, I was told when session started that there would be a substitute conforming to the Senate bill. And we're, we're never on board with a total vacating of. Now, House Representative Antonio Perkins uh, yesterday before the House voted question, why was Tennessee State the only public university in Tennessee that was hit with five audits in one year? And, and Chairman Reagan, I think I know you. And you know me. I know what kind of person you are. I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and call anybody in this room a racist or say that this is a racist issue, but I will talk about it being disparate. Because I don't want my mic cut off, but let's talk about the difference in how this university is treated. Let's talk about the fact that we had a finding of $544 million that was actually commissioned by our very own speaker. $250 million of those dollars were, were given to, the ten to Tennessee State University the next year, and I wish Today, I wish that we had not given that $250 million to Tennessee State University because that's when the fight began. As soon as the money was given to Tennessee State University, all of the problems became apparent or, or were sought after. $2 million put into the budget for an audit for a university Disparate never, ever happened in the history of the state of Tennessee. Seven audits. Y'all didn't know that, did you? Seven audits, five of them by the state. Those of you from East Tennessee, UT has never dealt with a situation like that. And I'm just talking about the disparate treatment of the one black university in our state. You have to ask yourself this, right? $544 million. Imagine what Tennessee State University looks like with an influx of $544 million. Imagine the people that could be there answering phones, helping students, scholarships, housing. But instead, we choose to hand over $250 million and then tell them how bad of a job they're doing. Well, how can you do a good job if you are short $544 million? Now, I want to speak to these members. I want to speak to these members that I know have an, uh, an independent mindset. I want to speak to the Sam Whitsons. I want to speak to the Mark Whites, the John Gillespie's, the Lowell Russells. Representative Parkinson, Representative Parkinson, 
I would, I would ask you not to call out names because that gets you in a, in a position. So Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thought I was speaking positively of them. But to those members who know when right is right and wrong is wrong, who will speak to the disparate treatment of our HBCU, our one land grant institution that we know has not been treated properly, then we turn the we turn the, the, the tables on them and say, you didn't get this corrected in the correct amount of time. Well, let's do let's do a, a seven audits or five audits from the state, and especially one for two million dollars that's looking for criminal activity on UT. Let's see how clean their audits come back. And I'm sorry, UT and President, I, I love you, and I'm, but I'm just trying to make a point, y'all. This is not right. We have the power to let this action be corrected. Let me tell you about power in my 47 seconds. Power gives you the ability to bless someone or the ability to destroy someone. You only get two things with power, the ability to bless someone or the ability to destroy someone. And to you members, I'm going to ask you this. How are you going to use your power today? Let's go to our panel. Um, the, the thing we, we discussed this yesterday, Matt, uh, and we've been talking about it all week. First of all, folks, we're going to be in uh, broadcasting live from Nashville on Monday. You can go to show the graphic. Uh, 11 a.m. Uh, local time, 12 Eastern. We're going to be in the state capitol rotunda um, broadcasting uh, a news conference. And then uh, that evening, uh, we're going to be on the campus of Tennessee State University hosting a two-hour town forum broadcasting from there. Guys, you have the graphic? All right. So um, so we're going to be there broadcasting. Uh, our uh, goal, of course, is to highlight these issues uh, and uh, to speak to the issues. Again, uh, everybody's invited open to the public that evening. We'll be on the campus again of Tennessee State. Uh, and so uh, look forward to that conversation. Uh, Matt, uh, you, you heard the representative there, Representative Parkinson, talk about uh, they had a committee two years ago that showed that Tennessee State had been underfunded by to the tune of $544 million. Then in September, the Biden-Harris administration sent letters out. Um, Education Secretary uh, Cardona and Bill Sack, Ag Secretary, stating that uh, a number of HBCU land-grant institutions uh, in about 16 states, uh, frankly, had been cheated out of $13 billion in land-grant money. In Georgia, the Black Caucus there sued Georgia. Fort Valley State, for instance, they said was owed $603 million. Uh, and I said to yesterday to Tennessee Representative Harold Ford, uh, and he said, well, we, you know, we were hoping we'd get this taken care of in the budget. I'm sitting there going, no, you got to sue them. I think there should be massive lawsuits in every single state where you have a public HBCU where they have been cheated out of this money story like this about Florida, and I think it was FAMU with a similar um, issue where they've been cheated out of money for decades. And that's what's so horrible about this is that they've underfunded this school for a very long time and are uh, hyper fixated on trying to issue there, despite the fact in one of the, the articles that I read that uh, the University of, Texas, of, of Tennessee, excuse me, at Knoxville um, apparently had some of the same housing issues and some of the other issues that have been attributed to TSU and its audit. And what I think is interesting about this situation is I was on the Tennessee State website to make sure I learned more about how the Board of Trustees is populated. And it looks like under Tennessee law, the governor gets to appoint eight of those 10 members on the, um, the board. So that's a problem because it seems like the lack of local governance is baked into the law. And it creates a situation where if you have a supermajority or you have a Republican or somebody who is uh, a, an enemy of the school, essentially, they can vacate a board because they serve at the, pr the pleasure of the governor. And I don't know all the procedural requirements for that, 
But the larger issue is if the schools don't have local uh, autonomy and local authority, then they're always subject to this exact thing happening. And what we know is it's targeting, full stop. I mean, the fact that UT Knoxville has had some of the same issues and has not had an inordinate number of audits in a very short period of time and isn't being called to the carpet um, shows you that they are looking for fault with the black school where they're not looking for fault with other flagship universities. But I think part of the issue is going forward, there needs to be um, a recalibration of how the schools can even govern themselves. And I know there are probably similar um, mechanisms in other states and similar board of trustee type situations, but the problem is Tennessee State needs to be able to govern itself. And the problem is with Bill Lee now being able to put in all 10 people um, on this board, or rather all eight of them, I think that um, are appointed by him. And then there's one other uh, member that's populated, I think, by the school, a faculty member. That allows him to control, and Republicans, frankly, to control Tennessee State's future going forward. So there are multiple issues at play here. And I think it's called the FOCUS Act. And if I were a Democrat in Tennessee, I would be working nonstop to repeal that so that the, the local schools have local autonomy. The thing here that I am trying, and I, we've been sounding this along, Kelly, and every HBCU where Republicans have a supermajority, they had better prepare themselves because Republicans are going to repeat this kind of crap here all across the, uh, the country, and especially all across the South. Absolutely. And I would go a step further and say, even if you have an HBCU that is not in a GOP stronghold, I would still urge those HBCUs to fight to make sure and ensure that they have um, self-governing capabilities because politics are politics. There's no guarantee that your governor will always be uh, an HBCU advocate. So you need to prepare yourself to to make sure that anything that comes your way, you you have solid footing and, and it, you won't be swayed one way or the other. But what I will say regarding Tennessee specifically, it is astounding to me how the, the half a billion dollars um, that they have not uh, yet received, that's how underfunded they have been, and yet they have some of the most incredible alumni in the world. They have some of the best students on the planet right now. The education that people get at TSU and every HBCU um, is, is bar none. And the fact that we have a history of being underfunded, the fact that we have a history of being disenfranchised and overlooked and under uh, uh, underfunded uh, um, across the board, and yet you still have this legacy of excellence. Can you imagine if we actually were funded, if we actually did get our worth? Um, and it wouldn't just be a benefit to just Black students. It would literally be a benefit to the entire country because it would be a reflection of the entire higher education system in this country and how excellent it can all be. But racism rears its ugly head <laughs> every time. And, and and we get stuff like this. And it, it to me, it's just sad. The fact that racism disenfranchises everyone, but they only think of themselves. And that's how um, things like this just keep going and perpetuate. Uh, Michael, um, I'm telling you, uh, people need to understand when you start looking at CRT, woke, right. DEI, affirmative action decision, everybody kept talking about after the affirmative action decision, oh, this is a silver lining for HBCUs. No, it's not. They are going to be attacked. And these Republicans are not going to want these places uh, to be bastions of black power. Correct, Roland. All this is a, a, a continuation of the U.S. Civil War in the in the in the Reconstruction. If you if you understand what these white supremacists were doing from 1865 to 1877, then going into the Jim Crow era where they're rewriting state constitutions to impose poll taxes and literacy tests to attack African Americans. This is a continuation of this, and it's and and it's a continuation of them using uh, the laws and the power of the state legislature as well as the governorship to attack African. 
African-Americans. I've said numerous times on this show, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and in the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties. And this is what we're seeing here. Everything that governs our lives turns on the vote. Uh, and, and reading the uh, article from NBC News on this, as well as one from uh, News Channel 5 uh, Nashville, they talk about how over a 30-year period of time, uh, Tennessee State University has been under uh, funded by the tune of $2.1 billion, okay? Uh, and that's uh, underfunded so, from, so, so, from the state. Right, no, 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 no. The $544 million is from the state. The $2.1 yeah. billion, that's what they're owed from the federal, because of those land-grant dollars from the federal government. Land, yeah, land grant is a, is a, a land grant colleges. Yeah, land grant. No, uh, anyway, I'm saying. So yesterday, when Harold Love was mm -hmm. on, he said that you had Republicans. They were they were trying to mix the two together. It's supposed to be no. Mm -hmm. Those are two separate pools of money. A a, a Tennessee committee in 2022 determined that Tennessee State was owed five. They were under underfunded to the tune of 544 million dollars by the state at 2.1 right. billion. That's what they actually are owed uh, as a result of those federal dollars. Okay, so we're talking about close to 2.6 2. 2. billion. So. 2.6 billion. Yep. 2.6 billion. Exactly. Okay. So all of this is is a fight over money and power, scarce wealth, power, and resources. And, and this also deals with the power of a governor. OK, because the governor has the authority to appoint the board uh, to uh, this HBCU, Tennessee State University. And as, as you, first of all, you did a fantastic segment, Roland. I watched the entire thing. It was about 46 minutes. And Dr. Greg Carr yesterday was was fantastic as well in his analysis on this. And he said that these white supremacists are running a Boston on us. And this is going to be the model that they use from state to state to yep. state. So this is why we have to fight back. This is about self-preservation. Uh, I keep letting folks know that this thing is real. Uh, so folks need to understand it's happening now. While that happened, the governor also signed a bill repealing police traffic stop performance made in Memphis after the fatal uh, beating of Tyree Nichols by Memphis cops in January 2023. GOP lawmakers pushed this bill despite pleas from Nichols' parents to give them a chance to find a compromise. Lee's signature means that the law, uh, out, the law uh, outlaws so-called uh, pretextual traffic stops, such as for a broken taillight and other mi minor violations, that that law is immediately rendered null and void. Lee agreed with Republican lawmakers who said Nichols' death needed to result uh, in accountability for officers who abuse power, but not new limits on how authorities conduct traffic stops. And this is what we talk about and the fact that they did. I mean, what th this is all because, Matt, they have a supermajority and they can do whatever they want. And it doesn't matter what Democrats have to say. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And it goes back to the, the same point I made earlier about local control and divesting Memphis, a, a democratic stronghold of its autonomy. But what I think is especially insidious about this particular bill is the messaging that they're trying to advance. And what they're saying is, yeah, the officers who engaged in this need to be held accountable, but we don't need to take away officers' ability to do what they think is right on the street. And they're trying to sell that as though it gives officers more freedom to make, you know, the stops that they think are appropriate in enforcing the law. But what it's really saying is we think the people in Memphis, one, can't do something that is, uh, you know, a justice a justice reform measure where you're going to stop officers from being able to use pretext stops, which is one of the biggest issues in policing, pretext stops, where they pull you over for some minor infraction to try to search your car, or do some other thing, and a major arrest ends up coming out of it, right? That happens all the time where they use a pretext to stop you. So not stopping uh, the police officers in Memphis from doing this sends a message to say, one, we don't think you can govern yourselves, and two, we're gonna give police officers carte blanche to do whatever they want, even if it is shown that those pretext stops don't correlate with 
a large number of felony stops and are racially divisive and racially discriminatory, which we know that they are both in Tennessee and across the country. So I think the messaging especially is problematic here because the people of Memphis elect their representatives and those representatives have the autonomy to decide what is best for their community. And that is normally what we hear conservatives trumpet in all of the state houses where conservatives have a supermajority, including here in Texas. So it's interesting that they turn back on their own word and ideology when it's advantageous for them to do so, despite crowing this all the rest of the time. The crazy thing for me, Kelly, is you got people who don't even live in Memphis, who are not from Memphis, who are now telling Memphis what they can do. And I guarantee you those same Republicans will be mad as hell if Memphis are telling them what to do in their city, in their county? Well, sure. But if if anything um, that the GOP is good for, um, it's hypocrisy. So what's good for the goose isn't always necessarily good for the gander as far as they're concerned. If it's good for them, it's good. If it's good for somebody else, it's bad. And they don't want that to happen. So I I echo Matt's sentiments. um, But really, this boils down to uh, a power grab, a disenfranchisement yet again of people of color in that jurisdiction and and trying to uh, maintain what little power they still have and have an attempt to grow that power so that they don't uh, come back into this situation. But hopefully with voting, with with uh, vigilance, um, you know, some things can turn back around. Um, we, we say it all the time, Michael, why voting matters. You've got Republicans in Louisiana, uh, that MAGA Jeff Landry, the, now the governor. Now mm-hmm. they want to rewrite the state's constitution in two weeks. People better, under- be people, people better understand what happened when you stay your ass at home. So all y'all people sitting there ta- talking about, uh, oh, I'm going to go ahead and stay at home uh, in November. OK, you're a damn fool. You're a damn fool and don't understand history. Go go back to 1898 when Louisiana rewrote their state constitution. They imposed poll taxes, literacy tests, a grandfather clause, but they also imposed a 9-3 uh, uh, a, a clause uh, for criminal court cases so that if you were found uh, guilty— in a, a, a criminal court case, it didn't have to be unanimous. It could be 9-3. And they did this specifically. When you go research this, they did this specifically to nullify any African-Americans that were on a jury because it was legal for African-Americans to serve on juries in Louisiana in 1898. So they did that so that if African-Americans on the jury found that an African-American uh, um, defendant was not guilty. Nine white people found them guilty. Guess what? You're guilty and you go to prison. That it, it, then uh, decades later, it was switched to 10 to two. It was made unanimous somewhere around 2018. OK, so this is this is a legacy of that Jim Crow era. People don't your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. When I hear people talking about not voting, staying at home, they are trying to wipe us off of the political chessboard. They're doing it at the state legislature level. They're doing it at the local level. They're trying to take back the, the White House, keep the House of Representatives, and take back the Senate. And then if you study what the Heritage Foundation is trying to do with Project 2025, OK, they're trying to repeat the same game that they ran in 1980 with the first uh, Reagan administration. The Heritage Foundation, this right wing think tank, they put out a book that contained 2000 policies that they wanted enacted by the Reagan administration. The Reagan administration enacted 60 percent of those policies, downsizing government, you know, uh, reversing policies that were beneficial for African-Americans. They're trying to do the same thing again because it worked and we still haven't figured this out. This is why voting is so important. But you have to understand history, economics, law and politics and how all this comes together. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So you, if you like this type of information, you can register for the online history classes that I teach on um, Saturdays, uh, Saturdays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, usually ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We had a great class this weekend. Our next class is Saturday, March 30th, uh, Saturday, April 6th, April 13th, April 20th. And then we have a couple more classes after that. Okay, so we have the information here. 
uh click here to register the lesson plan for all 10 sessions plus there was an introductory session the lesson plan is all laid out here so you can um see the type of content that we cover click here to download the lesson plan and you can register for the class um right here we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch it anytime so a year from now two years from now even after the course is over with you still have full access